Hello. Chapter 1 is about the microbial world in you. Microorganisms are important in our lives because everyone has microorganisms in their body and these are part of the normal microbiota and they help us to maintain good health. Microbiology is the field of science in charge of studying microorganisms. And what are microorganisms? Microorganisms are living small organisms. They are very, very small that they cannot be seen with the innate eye. Some microorganisms are important for us because they help us to produce foods and chemicals and some of the microorganisms that we know as pathogenic pathogenics, they can cause disease. So we have this classification of the microorganisms. So we have viruses, bacteria, archaea, fungi, protozoa, algae, and multicellular animal parasites. And although viruses themselves, they are not living organisms, we consider them in microbiology as part of the microorganisms because it's one of the classifications that we used to study them. So, as I was telling you, microorganisms are important. And many of these microorganisms help us to do the following. So they will help us to decompose organic waste such as when an animal dies. Also, some of them, they are capable of producing photosynthesis, and with photosynthesis, they produce oxygen for us, so they have a beneficial effect. Some of them, they help us to produce food and chemicals like ethanol, acetone, vinegar, cheese, bread, and other ones, they can help to make the garments that we use to make them softer, like the ones that are used in the clothing industry that produces an enzyme that is called cellulase. Other ones, they can be used in the pharmaceutical industry to produce, for instance, hormones like insulin that it is used to treat diabetes. So, one of the benefits of studying the microorganisms is that it helps us to prevent food spoilage, also help us to prevent disease, and it also help us to prevent these items from getting contaminated when they are going to be used in the case of the microbiology laboratories, or they can be used in surgeries. And these techniques, in order to prevent us from contaminating items is known as a septic technique. In a nomenclature system that it was designed by Carlos Linus in 1735, each living organism has two assigned names. The two names consist of a genus or the main name of the classification and they have a secondary name, which is known as a species or a specific epithet. And both of them are either underlined or idolized. And the first letter of the genus is always written with capitals. And the rest of the name will be in lowercase. So here we have an example of how to name these bacteria or these two species of bacteria that we have here. So we have this first one, this first example, Escherichia coli. In this case, this name, the genus, honors the discovered, which was Theodore Escherich. And coli, the a specific epithet, stands for the bacteria that lives in the large intestine. Now for Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus has a meaning. Staphylococcus means that it is a cluster of spheres. 
That's the arrangement in clusters. Staphylo means cluster, coccus means sphere, aureus is golden. So it is a cluster of golden like bacteria, like the one that we saw in here. And by the way, this is an image of a scanning electron micrograph that it was enhanced with a color by a computer. And then these two names, Escherichia coli and Staphylococcus aureus, can be abbreviated, like in the case of Escherichia coli, you call it E. coli, or for Staphylococcus aureus, you call it S. aureus, or sometimes just you call them staph. For the bacteria, it has major characteristics. So bacteria are unicellular organisms, and because they don't have a nucleus, they are classified as prokaryotic cells. And most of the bacteria have a peptidoglycan wall, and they divide by binary fission, not by mitosis. So what is binary fission? When one cell splits and gives to two cells, and then those two cells will split, and then gives four, etc. And bacteria can use a wide range of chemical substances for obtaining their nutrition and energy. Some of these examples of chemical substances that they can use will be organic chemicals, inorganic chemicals, or some of them they produce photosynthesis. Archaea consists of prokaryotic cells and they lack peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Instead of peptidoglycan, they have pseudomurine. And archaea includes methanogens, extreme halophiles, and extreme thermophiles. Fungi are eukaryotes. These will be cells that have a nucleus. Fungi have a cell wall that is made of chitin, and in order to obtain energy, they use chemical nutrients that are considered organic chemicals. And fungi, they live in the environment as unicellular yeast or multicellular molds and mushrooms. Molds, they have masses of mycelia that has individual filaments that we know as hyphae. Now, protozoans are unicellular eukaryotes. Protozoans obtain their energy by absorbing and ingesting these organic chemicals that they found in their environment, and they are large, typically, and they don't have a shape. They can move by extensions of the cytoplasm, the plasma membrane that we know as pseudopods, and by motion with cilia, and some of them, they may have a flagella. Algae are unicellular or multicellular eukaryotes, and they obtain their nourishment by photosynthesis. They have a cell wall made out of cellulose, and they produce molecular oxygen and organic compounds that are used by other organisms. Viruses are non-cellular parasites, and they consist of deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid, and they are surrounded by a nucleocapsid, and some of them, they may have a secondary coat that is made out of lipids, so they have a lipid envelope. And these viruses, they are replicated only when they are inside a living host. So, the major characteristics of the parasites. Parasites are multicellular animals that are flatworms or roundworms that are collectively called helminths. And although these adult stages of flatworms and roundworms can be seen without the aid of a microscope, the microscopic stages in life cycles like the eggs or the cyst, they can only be seen with the microscopes. 
All organisms are classified into one or three domains, bacteria, archaea, or eukarya. And eukarya includes protists, fungi, plants, and animals. Here is the diagram showing you this three domain system. So here we have the domain of bacteria, the domain of archaea, and the domain of eukarya. In a brief overview of the history of microbiology, we have several milestones. We have this researcher, which was Robert Hooke, who reported that living things are composed of little boxes or cells, and he was observing cork slices with his rudimentary microscope when he saw these little boxes through the microscope, and he called them cells. Now, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch merchant that used a simple microscope to observe microorganisms. And when he was observing this microscope, sorry, these microorganisms, he started to make drawings that are kept as part of the history of microbiology until today. Now, in 1858, many people believed in what it is known as the spontaneous generation. The idea that living organisms could arise from non-living matter. But in this time, Rudolf Virchow said that the cells actually arise from pre-existing cells, and he then coined this idea into what we know now as the cell theory, that all living things are composed of cells and come from pre-existing cells. It was until the mid-1880s that then many people believed this in this spontaneous generation that it was contradictory to what Rudolf Virchow believed. And there was this physician, Francisco Reddy, that tried to demonstrate that the spontaneous generation was not true. And he did that by putting decaying meat on flasks. And he put a, a flask in one of the flasks uh, lid to prevent flies from landing into this decaying meat. And he observed that only in the flask that it has the opening without the lid that you can see maggots arising from there. So it was then some of the observers of this experiment that Francesco Ritti did that couldn't believe that this experiment was enough to prove that the only living things can give rise to living things. So they were saying that because he put a lid on the flask, he was preventing the air from entering into the flask and part of the air was having kind of a special property that allows the living cells to arise. So in order to prove them wrong again, what Francesco, Francesco already did was to put actually a gauze on top of the flask and the flies couldn't land within this decaying meat and they couldn't lay their eggs so they didn't see any maggots or flies arising from this decayed um, decayed meat. Now John Needingham, which was one of the opposers of this mm. idea claimed that microorganisms could arise spontaneously from heated nutrient broth. And what he did is that he put, poured some of this heated broth into flask, and then he saw that some of these mm, 
flask where having some of microorganisms arising from them. But it was 20 years after that a researcher known as Lazarus Palanzani repeated Needham's experiments and suggested that Needham's results were due to the microorganisms in the air entering into the broth. So then, because of this, Louis Pasteur, a French researcher, he demonstrated that microorganisms are in the air. And in order for them for him to do that is that he actually heated some broth and have it in a flask with a short neck. And then he heated this neck and seal it. And the broth that was kept in this sealed flask never develop microorganisms. And again, people who believe that the air had special properties for the for the living or the decay matter or the broth to to have microorganisms, they said that they need to have a proof that air was coming into the flask so that they can believe that the microorganisms were not arising from coming from the air, but it's actually from the broth. So what Pasteur did is some of this flask where he put broth and he boiled it, he not only boiled the, the broth within the flask, but he also elongated the neck of the flask, making it like an S, S shape, and he allowed the passage of air through the flask, and then he proved that in this flask with the elongated neck that has the S shape and the air was coming into the broth that he boiled on in, that, in that flask, he proved that actually the broth remained sterile or didn't rise any microorganisms. So Pasteur discoveries then led to the proving wrong of this a spontaneous generation theory. Now, this is the way that this microscope that it was used by Antoine van Leeuwenhoek looked like. So he had a rudimentary lens within this plate of brass and he had a pin. And in this pin, he put some samples like from his teeth, from water of the ponds, and then he actually as well sell some of these microscopes and then he made drawings of these animacules that he called these microorganisms. Now, during the 1796, Edward Jenner demonstrated that inoculation or pudding Cowpox material provides humans with immunity against smallpox. And he did this because he observed in a milkmaid that the milkmaid never got this smallpox disease. And it turns out that the cows, they have a cowpox virus that it is part of the family of the smallpox. And the milkmaid, as he was milking the cows, he had a little microcut in the fingers. And through this microcut, part of the, the cowpox from the udders of the of the cow enter into the skin and then into the body of, of this milkmaid, and this milkmaid never developed a smallpox in a serious stage, as it happened when someone is not vaccinated. And because of this, he demonstrated then that this material from this cow cowpox material, you can prevent this serious infection and this uh, protection is called immunity. In the second goal age of microbiology, there were several discoveries, like the discovery of antibiotics like penicillin. 
Two types of chemotherapeutic agents are synthetic drugs. They are two. The ones that are synthetically produced in the labs, that we know as synthetic drugs, or the ones that are naturally produced by bacteria or fungi, that we know as antibiotics. In 1928, Alexander Fleming observed that penicillin fungus inhibited the growth of bacterial cultures that he was working with, and he named the active ingredient penicillin in 1928. Now, penicillin, it was used until the 1940s, and this was used to treat infectious diseases like uh, gonorrhea or syphilis. Now, syphilis, before the discovery of penicillin, was actually treated by an, an, a chemical that it was based on arsenic that it was called balsarban or salversan. And this was used to treat syphilis like around the 1900s. So this is one of the examples of the cultures that Fleming used to work with. So he was working with bacteria that he was growing in these circular containers or yeah, circular containers that we call petri dishes. And in these petri dishes inside, there is this nutrient that bacteria can grow with in that is known as agar. And bacteria forms little groups that are known as colonies. And in this case for Alexander Fleming, he was working with Staphylococcus aureus. And this is how the colonies look like. Now, he noticed in several occasions that he had a very large colony and that around this large colony, he saw tiny colonies that were not the same as the ones like in here. So if you, if you see here, these are very large and these ones are very small. So he started wondering why is this? Well, it is because this is a fungi, this is a contamination, and this fungi was releasing into the surroundings this penicillin that it was killing this bacteria and inhibiting the growth of that bacteria. Other developments of microbiology are basically the development of several branches of microbiology that help us to study specifically bacteria in the case of bacteriology, mycology in the case for study of fungi, virology for studying viruses, parasitology for studying protozoans and parasitic worms, and immunology that it is the study of immunity. More modern developments is uh, by new techniques in molecular biology and genetics. So we have microbial genetics, that is the study of how microorganisms inherit traits. Molecular biology, that study how DNA directs the synthesis of proteins. Genomics, which is a, a branch of science in which you will study how the organisms has provided these new tools for classifying all of these different microorganisms. And then we have recombinant DNA technology that has helped in the advance of all these sciences related to microbiology. In recombinant DNA, you have a combination of two different sources of DNA. And there is this researcher, Paul Berg, that was one of the first researchers to receive uh, a Nobel Prize because of his very important discovery. He inserted animal DNA into bacterial DNA to make a hybrid to produce an animal protein. Microorganisms, they degrade plants and animals and recycle the chemical elements to be 
used by living plants and animals. And bacteria, it is used to decompose matter in sewage. So all of these are part of bioremediation. Bioremediation are processes that are used to clean up toxic wastes. And bacteria with these toxic wastes that it uses obtains energy, but it helps us to detoxify pollutants like oil spills or mercury spills. So this is one of these very nice uses of bacteria that help us to clean up our environment. So this is bioremediation. Another use of microbes, it is by helping us to control the insects that can damage the crops. So with the aid of microbes that are pathogenic only to insects, there is an alternative to prevent using chemical pesticides that can damage not only the agricultural crops, but they can also damage human health and the environment, of course. So we have this example, Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a bacteria that it is fatal in insects, but is harmless to other animals, including anim uh, animals and humans and plants. Biotechnology, it is an important branch in which you will have the use of microbes to produce foods and chemicals. And it has been used for a long time, uh, production of beer, uh, the production of bread. It is well known that it has been happened for centuries. And here we have an example how in the cheese industry, we use these microorganisms to not only change the color of the cheese, but also the flavor and the texture. So using recombinant DNA, you will have what we call recombinant DNA technology. This will enable microorganisms like bacteria and fungi to produce variety of proteins, including vaccines and enzymes. And some of these can be genetically altered in order to help us to replace, for instance, defective genes in human cells through what we call the gene therapy. Now within our body, we have more microbial cells than human cells. While we will have like around 30 trillion cells in our body, we will have like around 40 trillion cells of bacteria. And these bacteria that live on our surface of our body is known as normal microbiota. And this bacteria, since it is part of the normal skin or surfaces of our body, it helps us to protect us against pathogenic or disease producing microorganisms. Now, bacteria not only help us to prevent infections, but also help us to produce important vitamins in our body like vitamin K, vitamin B, B2, uh, vitamin sorry, folic acid, and also these microorganisms inhibit the growth of pathogenic bacteria by creating resistant factors that help us to prevent infections. Now, microorganisms, they can live in bacterial communities that form slimy layers on surfaces, and these are called biofilms. Biofilms can exist anywhere. They can be in rocks, pipes, teeth, and medical implants, like in this case. And it is important then to follow an aseptic technique, in some cases, like in the case of medical implants or catheters, to prevent the introduction of these microorganisms into the body and causing infections. Lastly, uh, infectious diseases can be part of the 
what we call emerging infectious diseases. And this is either a new or a changing disease that shows a potential to increase in incidence or increase the seriousness of the infections. And we have seen the resurgence of all diseases that are part as well of the emerging infectious diseases, like in the case of tuberculosis. So some examples of these emerging infectious diseases will be avian influenza A. And avian influenza A is caused by this virus that is called influenza A virus, that it is primarily a virus found in waterfowl or poultry. But some of these strains of viruses can get in contact with humans and then they can create infections in us. So this is an example of influenza virus with this protective coat that has spikes. Another example of an emerging infectious disease is the appearance of bacterial strains that are resistant to many antibiotics, including what we call MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This Staphylococcus aureus was susceptible to the action of penicillin, but it was in the 1950s when penicillin resistant was starting to be developed by this bacteria. And then in the 1980s, penicillin and methicillin were not affected by Staph aureus, or Staph aureus, sorry, wasn't affected by methicillin in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, Staphylococcus aureus was resistant to the action of this vancomycin antibiotic. And then you had two strains of Staphylococcus, and a strain that is intermediately resistant, that is called Visa and Versa, which was a strain of Staph aureus that is, was resistant to vancomycin and completely resistant. Another example of an emerging infectious disease is West Nile encephalitis caused by, by West Nile virus. Not so long ago, there was a case nearby of West Nile virus, and this West Nile virus was imported from Africa, from the West Nile region of Uganda in 1937. And it appeared in New York City in 1999 because they brought it by non migratory birds that were found in these cheap boats that were coming from Africa. And from there, from New York City, part of these non-migratory birds were introduced into 47 states. And most of the states right now have this West Nile virus that actually it is transmitted by the bite of this mosquito, Anopheles. Other infectious diseases are produced by proteinaceous infections agents that we know as prions. Prions are proteins that are infectious. This is something that it was fairly new when the prions were discovered because proteins normally are not known to produce a disease or an infection. But in this case, these prions infect the brain of humans and they can cause holes in the brain, like in this case, so this is brain tissue and these holes that you see it's part of the damage that these proteins causes. And this particular prions causes something that is called spongiform encephalopathies, in which the brain tissue looks like a sponge because it has several holes. And some of these encephalopathies are very rare, but they can occur. Now, in the case of some infectious diseases of this kind, they have a name, and they have, for instance, this name, Kreutzfeldt jacobs disease. Echerichia coli is part of the normal flora, but some of them, they might have changed their genome or their DNA, and they become virulent, like in the case of Echerichia coli O157H7. These bacteria produces the toxin that damages 
the intestinal cells. So in here we have two intestinal cells with this bacteria and with these toxins, these intestinal cells become eroded and the person will have bloody diarrhea. And it was first seen in 1982. Ebola hemorrhagic fever, it's another type of emerging infectious disease and this is caused by Ebola virus. Ebola virus is one of the largest viruses that exist and this virus infects the blood vessels causing fever, hemorrhage and blood clothing. It was first identified in Congo next to the Ebola river and every few years we have outbreaks of Ebola. Another emerging infectious disease is cryptosporidiosis caused by the protozoan cryptosporidium parvum. This was first reported in 1976 and it causes 30% of the diarrhea illnesses in developing countries. In the United States, it is transmitted by uh, ingesting contaminated water with this protozoan. And this protozoan, it is very tiny, but infects this cells of the intestines and it damages them and then it makes the person to have a severe profuse diarrhea and if the person doesn't seek immediate medical attention it can die of dehydration. Now one of the important characteristics of this cryptosporidium protozoa is that it is resistant to chlorine, to chlorination. So uh, one of the things that it can happen, for instance, if a person who has cryptosporidiosis goes into the swimming pool and he has this infectious and he has an accident within the water, well, then the uh, persons around there who will be swimming, they ingest accidentally the water and then they will ha have the infection and then they will have the diarrhea. Another emerging infectious disease is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. This is caused by human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. It was first identified in the United States in 1981. And it, it is a pandemic disease in which we have more than 33 million people affected with 7,500 new cases every day being produced. It is mainly transmitted by sexually transmission that affects both males and females. And HIV here in the United States affects 26% uh, or well, 26% of the persons who are infected with HIV are female and 49% of them uh, are the affected ones are uh, 